morning. Oh, it is good to be here. I can't tell you. I am very excited about today. I'm very excited about what we're going to be studying. I'm so excited about worshiping together. We have a lot to be excited for this morning, okay? I know it's easy to kind of focus on all the things that bother us and that annoy us, but guess what? Today is the day that the Lord has made, right? Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So God is present all the time. We are so grateful for him in our lives. This morning I was uh, enjoying God's nature quite a bit. So this morning I saw some squirrels playing tag. I saw the noisiest little birds, small, tiny, tiny little birds, but making the loudest racket. I saw a woodpecker fly directly over my head a few feet. It was amazing. And then to top it all off, I saw an armadillo or armadillo, armadillo, (laughs) armadillo swimming in our swimming pool. So I'm sure I'll get to share more of that with you at another time, but uh, it is on film, and it was pretty, it was pretty fun. <laughs> but we are so grateful that you're here with us worshiping today, and if you're joining with us online, we are grateful that you are uh, also worshiping with us today. So let's worship together this morning. Give the holy roar of God resound. Give the holy roar of God resound. Watch the waters part before us now. Watch the waters part before us now. Come and see what He has done for us. Tell the world of His great love, our God is the God who saves. Our God. Yeah. 
suspense <laughs> all right i guess we'll we'll skip that video we'll save that for next week <laughs> but before we get started i have a few things that i just need to uh address the first one is this evening we have a senior blessing for isaac Tennant. so we'd love for you to come back tonight it's at 5 p.m it's not going to be a whole lot of time uh but we're going to have some worship together we're going to recognize isaac wish him well and so we'd love for you to come back this evening at 5 p.m so today I am so excited about our series. You can see it on the screen, Daniel the Sovereign God, Daniel and his Sovereign God. Uh, but before, before we get to Daniel, just a few more things, okay? Number one, we are so blessed. We're so blessed. Um, last week we were able to hear from one of our elders, Kevin Trent, and he did a fabulous job. 
he came with so much genuineness and so much transparency in his life and how God has been working in his life and bringing us this crucial understanding of meeting God before any other effort on our part, meeting him in spirit, going to God, hearing that still small voice. And so I'm just so grateful that he was able to present to us in that way, and it is a blessing. Also, we are so blessed that we have just come from a, a summer of fun with our student ministry, and Janelle Gardner has done a fantastic job as an intern this summer. And I wish she was here so we could roar and stand and give her some applause, but that is a no small feat to do a summer internship in, in this summer, 2020. So the, the summer of 2020 is a hard year for a summer intern, having to deal with social distancing and masks and rules and all this, and she just did such a great job, and so, so grateful for that. So we have a lot to be thankful for here at Argyle. And also, one more thing before we get to Daniel. Um, I loved our series about being still and meeting God, going to, into the presence of God. And it, and it was such a blessing for me to be able to, to preach a series on being still and, and connecting with God and then to kind of finish that for me personally with a, a week off. So I had a week off of vacation, and I stayed at the house. It was a staycation. So it was, it was a, a wonderful time just to connect with God, and it just reminded me of the things that we've been talking about, the things about having a secret life with God in the secret place. God doesn't want our religious PR. He wants us. And so we meet him where we know we can find him. And so I was able to, to practice that and spend time with God, stopping just stopping what we do, stopping and resting with God in our life. We do so much. We have so much activity in our life, and sometimes God just wants us to stop. It's not about all the things that we do. It's about our relationship with him. And so sometimes God just wants us to stop what you're doing. You've done enough. Stop. Stop and to have these routines in our life of going to the secret place, a secret life with God, of having rest in our life, that there's only so much we can do. And God says, stop, I want you to rest and be with me. And so what a blessing that was. And finding him in the word by first seeking him first. So just these lessons from this Be Still series have been such a blessing for me just in this past uh, week when I was able to take a week of vacation. And the importance of it. Why? Why do we seek his presence in our lives? Why do we seek his presence in our lives? Is because we are the temple of his presence. How amazing is this? How incredible is this? That we are the temple. And so I just want to read this passage that I read to you a couple weeks ago just to reiterate how important this is that we are still, that we have a secret life with God in the secret place. And so we'll read Ephesians 3, 14 through 19 again this morning. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant to you to be strengthened. This is a prayer to be strengthened. Strengthened for what? Strengthened for hardship that's about to come our way? Strengthened for what? We'll get to that. That you may be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend. A phrase that you do not hear very often, that you may have the strength to comprehend. This is not weak-minded stuff. You need strength to comprehend what? With all the saints, what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Not that we just have it in our minds, that we experience the love of Christ in our lives. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And that's why, that's why we seek God in the stillness. Because his presence 
so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. And so I just couldn't help. I couldn't help but just mention that one more time to us. But we are obviously somewhere else today. I don't know if you've noticed I got some, a new podium up here today. I don't know if you, you like it or not, but we, we find ourselves in Babylon this morning. So we're, we're starting a new series, and we are about to enter into eight weeks of studying the life of Daniel, and not only the life and lessons from Daniel, but also the sovereignty of God and what we learn from his life and how we see God in a very real way through a, an incredible story of how God is sovereign in, in Daniel's life. And so I have a question for us this morning to kind of start off this series. How many of you like virtual experiences? Okay, I got one hand, two. Okay, <laughs> all right, we have, some, we have some that like virtual experiences. Now, I guess it depends on what, what, what you think I mean by virtual experience, you know. And I'm not talking about... Uh, really high tech, like the, the VR, virtual reality type of stuff. I'm talking about like Zoom meetings. And uh, I know we got some virtual uh, people joining us for church this morning. Um, so I don't know how you feel about virtual things. Question two. These are going to seem very unrelated. How many of you like roller coasters? Anybody? Okay. We, some people love roller coasters. Some people hate roller coasters. And so it's either like you're in like one camp or the other, other normally. You either love them or you hate them or maybe you just tolerate them, okay? So for this morning, I, I wanted to have a virtual coaster experience. Now, I, I want you to understand that number one, if you do not want to participate this, in this, you do not need to participate in this, okay? But if you are willing, if you're willing, you, you can join me for a virtual roller coaster uh, experience. And those of you who are streaming online, if you're on your couch, if you're with your family, go ahead, strap in, get on the roller coaster. And it's no fun, it's no fun to ride a roller coaster by yourself. So I, I need a, a friend. So go ahead, friend, join me up here on stage. And we are about to enter. And by the way, this is going to only be, this is less than one minute of silliness, okay? And there's, there's a reason for this, but go ahead. We're going to go ahead and strap in here. Go ahead and get strapped in. You've got to be safe here, Ashton. Okay. All right. And let's go ahead. Let's get ready for our roller coaster. Those of you in the audience, join me when we, uh, when we take turns. Go ahead and, and lean into the turns. If you feel like uh, joy and, and, and if you're a yeller on a roller coaster, go ahead, yell it out, hands up. Uh, feel free to join me on this virtual roller coaster. By the way, we did this, <laughs> we did this like six or seven years at an Oasis youth rally here, so we're bringing it back. Let's go ahead and roll our virtual experience. You can un unbuckle, have a seat. Thank you, friend. <laughs> so, I don't know about you, but there's something that doesn't quite translate <laughs> with a virtual coaster, right? It's a little bit different, right? When, when you're there and you're actually feeling the wind in your face, and it's thrilling, and the people behind you are screaming. It's a little bit different when you're sitting in a pew, and you're watching a, a screen, and you're, you're, you're imagining being on a roller coaster. It doesn't quite translate. Well, it also doesn't quite translate when you take the same physical experience, the same G-forces, the same turns and everything, but instead of a roller coaster, let's say you're in a van, Okay. It's not quite the same experience. So, for example, let's say we've got a youth trip, 
uh, back in the day, and I'm loading it up with students, and we've got some brave adults that are joining on as some chaperones, and you're there in the back seat of the van, and all of a sudden, you experience some roller coaster type motion in the van. It doesn't exactly translate, does it? Because if you're in the back of the van and you start to feel some G-forces and your stomach comes up to your throat, uh, you're probably not raising your hands in the air yelling for joy. Okay, that inner backseat driver probably is coming out real quick and you've got anxiety and it's very different experience, isn't it? Well, here's the difference. And this is the, the reason that I brought that up is because there is a difference between the two. In one, we've got hands up, we're shouting, we're leaning into turns, we're having a, a great time. But the difference is, is that we have confidence in the coaster. You know, like that coaster is running all day long. You have to wait in line sometimes for even hours. And it's going and going day after day and day after day. And so you have confidence in the coaster. There's a trust issue there. You trust it. And so when you trust the course, when you trust in the course and you are confident in the journey, you can enjoy the ride. Do you see the difference there? You can have those same, the same physical motions in the van or the roller coaster, but the difference is, is when you can have trust in the course and confidence in the journey, you're able to experience it completely different. In one scenario, you want to go again. In one scenario, you're paying hundreds of dollars to go to a park and experience this. In another one, you're terrified. Why did I ever sign up for this youth trip? They're very different experiences, and we understand the difference why. It's because of the trust. It's because of the confidence. And I say that because as we get into the story of Daniel, what we understand is that throughout this study that we will discover that our God is sovereign. Our God is in control. And that should be very meaningful to us. So let's talk about sovereign or sovereignty. God has absolute right to do as he pleases, and he is in full control. The clay doesn't uh, speak back to the potter and say, hey, why did you form me this way? That would be absurd, wouldn't it? God has the absolute right to do as he pleases. He is creator God, and he speaks, and it, and it, is, it comes to life. He has absolute right to do as he pleases, and he is in full control. And we will see that throughout the story of Daniel and throughout his life. And here's what we want to understand. Here's what we want to take away from this study of Daniel, is that when we're able to pair, when we're able to understand the sovereignty of God, we're able to, to understand that in our minds, and we're able to pair that with a real, authentic relationship with God. What that it does for us as followers is it gives us peace. It gives us perfect peace. And I think that we'll see that throughout this story of Daniel. So I don't know how many of you were able to see online and read Daniel chapter 1, but that's our text for this morning. So um, I'll try to put reminders. We'll put it out in the email and online for uh, future readings as you, before you come to, to, to worship. But let's go ahead and begin in Daniel chapter 1, starting in verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans, 
The king assigned them a daily portion of food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. So here we have the beginning of the story. We have Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who comes and he besieged Jerusalem. And I, I don't know if you noticed my inflection in the reading, but it was God that gave them into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. And so when Nebuchadnezzar came and he, and he besieged Jerusalem, he took with him vessels from the house of God, drinking vessels from the house of God. And there was a transfer that took place from the house of God to the house of God, from big G to little g. And not only was there a transfer of these vessels from the house of God to the house of God, big G to little g, but there was also this rounding up of people, a collection of people. So who did they collect? Oh, that sounds fun out there. <laughs> so who did they collect? Okay, it, they, there was a roundup, a collection of people, both of royal and of nobility, use without blemish, so no pimples, um, good appearance, okay, good, healthy, skillful uh, wisdom, uh, these young people, and they were put into a three-year process. And I know if you're familiar with the story, you've heard this, you know this, but I want us to really think about this and dwell on what this means. They were put into a three-year process to change them, to fundamentally change who they were, to change their language, to change what they ate and drank, to change their name. I'm Daniel. No, you're not. That's not who you are. Can you imagine that? You introduce yourself and someone says, no, that's not you. That's not your name anymore. They're put in this three-year process to change who they are. And so these are the main characters. We've got Daniel, who's no longer Daniel anymore. He's Belshazzar. We've got Hananiah, who's now Shadrach. Mishael is, is now Meshach. Azariah is Abednego. And so they're put on this course to change them. So let's continue the story in verse 8. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigns your food and your drink. For why should he see that you are in worse condition than the youths who are your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, it was seen that they were in better, they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. <laughs> so let's talk about this. So Daniel, he, he goes to, uh, to Ashpenaz, who is the chief eunuch, and he asks him, please, he asks for permission. I don't want to defile myself. I don't want to eat these things. I know you're trying to change me. I know I'm in this process of, of becoming new. I know I'm not Daniel, but I don't want to defile myself. And it says that he found favor in the eyes of Ashpenaz. 
he had found favor, but it wasn't quite enough. Because Ashpenaz still had reservations. He said, well, what will this look like on me? This is going to be a poor reflection on me. If you're over there eating vegetables, and then by the time the king sees you, you're not, you're not in as good a condition as all these other people eating this royal food and this royal wine. Okay, so Daniel kind of tucks that away. And then he approaches the steward of Ashpenaz, and he asks him, instead of permission to not defile himself, he asks for a test. He basically says, put me to test and then deal with me accordingly. And he says, for 10 days, we won't eat the king's food and the king's wine. And I can't help but read this but, and think of Epcot Food and Wine Festival. Okay, I don't know if you've been there before, but it's just this elaborate food and, and delicacies. And here, these, these, these young Jewish captives had the ability to eat the king's food and the king's wine. I'm sure it was pretty good, guys. I'm sure they could smell it, the royal chefs, as they're preparing the food. And so you could have king's food and king's wine or vegetables. <laughs> God is sovereign. Because at the end of the 10 days, these vegetables packed on some pounds, okay? And from this experience, we see God's sovereignty continue to be played out. And when we see D Daniel say this quote, it says that Daniel resolved he would not defile himself. I want you to understand that maybe I I've approached Scripture this way or seen it this way. I want you to understand this is not Daniel. This is not the same as someone who is not trying to cheat on their diet. Okay, get that brownie away from me. I am resolved. I'm not going to eat that. Get that cookie away from me. I, I have resolved not to eat that, not to put that. I am on a mission here. This is not that. Remember that Daniel has started a three-year program to transform these Jewish captives basically into Babylonians. And what better way to do so than to wine and dine them? Give them the best of the best, the best food they could possibly have access to, the best wines to enjoy. But Daniel resolved he would not defile himself. This is Daniel. He is a captured exile living in a polytheistic culture that has overtaken both the people of God and the land of God. Hear that. Hear that. Daniel is living in a polytheistic culture where they have overtaken both the people of God and the land of God, and yet he is still resolved not to defile himself. He still believes in the sovereignty and the control of God. This is amazing. They were put in a new culture. And culture will compete for your loyalty. You know, we find ourselves in a culture that is not our own. When we are the children of God, we know where our home is. We know where our citizenship is. It lays in heaven. We're children of God. And we find ourselves in a culture very similar to Daniel. We find ourselves in a culture that is in desperate need of God. We find ourselves in a culture where it's easy for us to blend in. It's easy for us to just be, be God's people, but in a way in which we've, we kind of just fit in real nice. Culture will compete for our loyalties. What is fighting for your loyalties? Or what loyalties are fighting for you, should I say? We have loyalties to our country. We have loyalties to a business. We have loyalties to brand loyalty. No, I only wear these shoes. I only wear this product. I only use this type of, of phone. We have brand loyalties. We have a loyalties to political parties. We have loyalties to sports teams. We have loyalties to pop culture. We have loyalties to social media. And there's nothing wrong with being loyal. There's nothing wrong with being loyal, but at what cost? Do any of our loyalties interfere with our ultimate loyalty to our Father in heaven? How can we live in a culture that needs God and live faithfully to our God? So the question is, when we find ourselves often in a hostile culture, will we or how will we remain faithful to God? 
And somehow, some way, Daniel still believed in God's sovereignty, even as a captive of war. Even as a captive of war, Daniel understood in the sovereignty of God. So we'll finish out this chapter in verse 17. It says, as for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of, the, uh, the first year of King Cyrus. So the end of the story of chapter one is that they impressed the king. They went through this three-year process and somehow God was sovereign that they wouldn't defile themselves. And at the end of the three years, God blessed them. God gave them uh, growth and learning and skill. He gave Daniel the ability and dreams. And so what's our takeaway today? As we're at this point in the story of Daniel, what is our takeaway today? I want us to begin to ask ourselves this question of how are we to be faithful in hostility? How are we to be faithful in a hostile culture? How are we to be faithful when we find ourselves in a culture that is in desperate need of God? And God is calling us to be faithful in the culture that we are in. I was, I was uh, very encouraged. I had a, a great conversation with Janet in the office this, uh, this past week, and I was just gleaning off some of her wisdom as we talked about the different struggles and faithfulness throughout our lives. And we all struggle with this in different ways. And so children, you have a different challenge in front of you. I think children, you know, we come into this life completely dependent. We don't know how to sleep. We don't know how to eat. We can't do anything. We have to be held. And so everything's out of our control. But as we get a little older and as we start walking, we have issues with authority and we have to listen to our mom and dad. Will we be faithful to obey our parents as little kids? And then we get a little bit older and we start to develop a little bit more independence and we have more influences in our life than just besides mom and dad. We start having friends that have an impact on our life. Will you remain faithful in peer pressure? Will you remain faithful when you find yourself submerged in a culture, not just in your schools, but on your phone as you're with your peers at any moment in time? Will you remain faithful to God in that pressure? And then we get a little bit older and we graduate and we're excited to, to spend some time with Isaac tonight, but we get a little bit older and, and then we become baby adults. Right? We, we, we start to have that independence. And now all, we can, we can wake up when we want. We can choose choice A, B, or It's our choice. We have that independence. Will we remain faithful in our independence, young people? As you experience that independence, independence in your life, will you choose faithfulness to God in your independence? And then as adults in a fast-paced life, will we remain faithful to God? When we have to deal with life stresses, when we have to have competing loyalties in our life, will we remain faithful to God? Will we resolve not to defile ourselves in a culture that needs God? And then for those of you who are in retirement, in retirement and, and beyond, we're always in transition, and I think maybe that's another transition that is a very difficult one as you try to find your new ministry, as life is now changed for you, as you are in different circles, as, as your, maybe your kids are gone, or maybe you have, you're not in the position that you were in your job. As you try to figure out, what is my ministry now? Will you remain faithful to God when you have to deal with loss? Dealing with loss, will you be remain faithful to God? When you have to deal with health issues with your, with your own body, will you remain faithful to God? Will you understand that He is in control even when my body is failing? 
Will you remain faithful to God? Will you remain faithful when you're facing death itself? When everything is out of your control, when everything looks like it's, it, it, it's frustrating, you're, you're sad, you don't know how to make sense of what's going on in your life, will you resolve not to be defiled? Will you understand that your faithfulness can be accomplished because of God's sovereignty? He is in control. A lot of times we don't see it. A lot of times we just, we struggle with that and we don't see where God is. Daniel was a captive of war and a program to transform who he was, his language, his diet, his name, his religion. But he resolved not to defile himself. So how can we do it? How can we remain faithful in hostility? I think it's this, when we pair, like I mentioned earlier, when we pair God's sovereignty with our relationship with him, we have nothing to fear. Do you believe that this morning? Do you? (laughs) I want you to know that. As God's people, we have nothing to fear. What we have found in God cannot be taken away from us. Whether it's from the hungry jaws of a predator that wants to rip us to shreds or if it's the fact that we may become ashes by fire, which we'll get to in the story of Daniel, we have nothing to fear. What we have found in God, the peace that we have in our relationship with the Lord cannot be taken away from us. God is sovereign. We can face anything that comes our way. And it's not on your strength. It's not on my strength. It's on our faith in a sovereign God who even when it looks like, where are you? When I've been taken from my people, when I've seen death, when I'm being forced into a culture that I don't even want to be a part of, when I'm a captive of war, God is sovereign. And when we understand that God is sovereign and when we have a real relationship with him, that allows us to to unveil, to discover a peace. A peace that passes understanding. A peace that we experience. Because our God is a good God. And he loves us. And even when everything looks the opposite. God is in control. Let's pray. Lord, we just want to ask this morning that you will continue to be with us as we study the life of Daniel. And Lord, I know that there are some people that are hearing this message that can relate to Daniel. I know that there are people that struggling to see you. Lord, I know that there are people that are so frustrated with our world right now. So desperate for an answer. Lord, I pray that we will remember that you are sovereign. You are in control. And Lord, what we share with Daniel, Lord, I pray that it will just put a fire in our belly. Lord, I pray that we will come to the point where we can be resolved just like Daniel, that we will face anything for you, God. We will face flames for you because we know you. And so, Lord, I pray that you touch each of our hearts, that you remind us of your sovereignty, that you remind us that you are in control, that we do not have to have all of the answers, Lord, but we can trust in you. And so, Lord, I pray that you build us up with courage in light of this reality, Lord. We love you and we thank you for your son. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.
sorry. I'm sorry. So, like I said, I heard a quote this morning or on the way to work that said, Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship. I don't know who said it. I don't know if it came from anybody famous. I just heard it on the radio. But it really resonated with me. It made me think. In the couple of times I've had an opportunity to come here and share my thoughts about before we partook of communion together as a family, I really tried to impress that coming up here is a celebration. The sacrifice that Christ bore on the cross is something to be celebrated. You see, our God sent his son to earth, knowing full well he was going to die, knowing full well how he was going to die and the sacrifice and pain that Christ would endure. Christ, when he came to earth, volunteered to go through that suffering, volunteered knowing he was going to be in pain. That's why he gave himself over when he was arrested. We are so blessed to have a father in heaven who is willing to give his son, knowing what was going to happen, so that we can have that relationship with him. We are so blessed that Jesus would come to earth, leaving heaven, that, and something we can't imagine, knowing that he was going to be hung on a cross and suffer in immense pain. Brothers and sisters, that is something we're celebrating. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you today that we have an opportunity to partake of communion together. I pray that we can take of it joyfully knowing that the bread that represents the flesh that was broken on the cross and the juice that we drink represents the blood that was shed on the cross was so that we could have a relationship with you. There's no other way that we could fill that gap to be able to come to you in prayer. There's no way we could have done that without sacrifice. And we are so grateful to you, Father, for that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as, as we sing this last song, let's everybody stand for this last song, and that will, that will dismiss us today for worship. with me, leads me safely through the sinking sand, it is the Christ of Calvary, this would be my prayer to Lord each day to help me do the best I can, for I need thy life to guide me day and night, blessed Jesus, hold my hand, blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Jesus, oh my.
toward the setting of the sun. Lead me safely to a land of rest, if I am proud of life and one. I have put my faith in thee, dear Lord, that I may reach the golden strand. There's no other friend on whom I can depend, blessed Jesus, for my Thank you for...